Hey guys, so as you guys are already aware, we've moved into the technological world and in your textbook, this can be found on pages 376 to 425. All right, so we started looking at the design process and we looked at the different phases of the design process. So I spoke to you and I said, okay, here's the deal guys. We need to be able to identify a need or a problem. But in order to do that, I said, what did I say? Can you guys remember? I said that we need to be able to empathize. We need to be able to put ourselves in other people's shoes or other organism shoes, or just be able to look at things from a different perspective in order to identify a need or a problem, okay? So once you identify this need or problem, well, what's the technological problem behind this? What is it that's stopping this, um, this goal from being achieved? Okay, so we, we analyzed that and then we figured out, okay, now we know that there is a need or a problem and we've identified the technological problem. Now the question arises, has this problem been solved already? Has a product or something been engineered that can solve this problem already? Because we don't want to waste our time creating something that has already been created. Worse enough, if it's something that's been patented, we could get in trouble for duplicating someone else's idea. All right, so has the problem been solved? Yes, then back to the drawing board or redirecting the people who are having the issue to this actual product that has already been fabricated or manu I'm sorry, manufactured, okay? And then no, if this problem has not been solved, then you know what, you get the ball rolling and you're moving on to the next phase of the design process. Alrighty, so the next phase of the design process is that we're basically um, moving into the production, but we actually have to, you know, make some plans before we can actually produce something. Right, so we have to write a set of specifications. So we've heard that word abbreviated before we say specs, right? But you can see on page 379, there is um, details of what specifications are. So I'll just read that to you. On page 379, contents of the specifications. When preparing specifications, the function of the object must be defined what will it be used for? Then the object must be described as accurately as possible by answering the following questions. What are the requirements of manufacturing use and maintenance? What standards must this object meet? What are the object's characteristics? What are the manufacturing costs? What is the completion deadline for each stage? What is the project's feasibility? So this is basically like what I said in class, this is like a Bible of this product. You're looking at time constraints, you're looking at what is it used for, you're looking at the characteristics, like how much is, uh, how much does this thing weigh, what, pro what uh, materials are we using, it's basically like a Bible of this new product. <laughs> okay, so when we've um, come up with all the specifications and we figured out, okay, um, we made a design plan, how is this going to look, what are the dimensions, how are things going to be tech, um, how are things going to be connected to each other, uh, and make a technical drawing, we manufacture a prototype. So a prototype is just basically like a model of what this actual product will be like. Okay, so you test it. Right After you test it, you're checking to see, does it meet the specifications? Meaning this thing was, it was being made for specific use. Is it, is it fulfilling that need? Is it, is it durable? Is it breaking? Do we need to tweak it? Okay, so you're testing the prototype to see if it actually meets the specs. All right, so yes, it meets the specs. Um, we mentioned this in class. Do you think you'll do one prototype? Probably not. You probably won't be that lucky to nail it right on the first try. So you will do multiple prototypes. And then finally, when it does meet the specs and everything is okay, 
what happens, you can move on to actually producing this thing, right? Okay, so we can move on to producing it, but we're gonna apply for a patent, okay? So this patent is like this government document that just basically um, tells people, hey, this idea is owned by someone. So the exact definition of a patent is a government authority or license conferring a right or title for a set period, especially the sole right to exclude others from making, using, or selling an invention. Okay, so you want to protect your invention, right? So because you most likely made it, yes, out of the goodness of your heart to fulfill a need or solve a problem. But at the same time, too, you probably want to make some money off of this, or you wouldn't want somebody to make some money off of your idea. Alrighty, so now you've had your patent, you have your design, you've tested your prototype, you know that this is a go. So you are moving on to phase two, which is the production phase. Okay, so on page 376, you can see an overview of the production phase. It says, the moment has come to manufacture the product. The steps to follow are preparing a manufacturing file, including a manufacturing process sheet and flow process grid. Let's find out some more information about that. All right, so you can find out more about the manufacturing process sheet on page 385. Okay, so the manufacturing process sheet is a document describing every stage in the manufacturing of the motors part. So remember in the textbook, they have actually have an example that they're um, working through. This document is called the manufacturing process sheet. The people also give them a document that describes each stage in the assembly process. This document is called a flow process grid. These two documents are a little like recipes. The person manufacturing the parts follows the letter, um, follows to the letter the steps described in the manufacturing process sheet and the flow process grid. When writing processing sheets like these, you must always assume that the person using them knows nothing about the project. It is therefore very important to describe each step clearly. The manufacturing process sheet lists all material and tools to be used. It indicates the order in which, in which each operation must be performed. It also specifies how much time they will take. Furthermore, it states the number of workers needed for each stage. When all the parts are ready, they must be assembled. Then the flow process grid lays out the stages of assembly of the final product. So again, to summarize the steps of the production phase, which is phase two, on page 376, we can resume reading that. Production. The moment has come to manufacture the product. The steps to follow are preparing a manufacturing file, including a manufacturing process sheet and flow process grid. Next, manufacturing, including parts manufacturing, assembly, packaging, various quality controls and compliance with standards. Three, writing and publishing an instruction manual for customers and a maintenance manual for companies providing after sales service. Okay, so the reality of it is after we make this product, people have to be able to um, fix it if something goes wrong, right? If something goes wrong, that is fixable. So whoever's taking care of that needs to have some sort of maintenance manual on how to do that successfully. Okay, it says their engineers are involved mainly in the first of these three stages. We'll explain more about it in the following pages. So that was page 376. So now we move on to phase three of the design process 
which is marketing. All right, so marketing introduces the manufactured object to people who might need it. So this is page 377. It also gets the object distributed to those who are, who are ready to buy it. It involves organizing the product's commercial development, setting the sales price, doing promotion, setting up delivery, et cetera. We must also ensure the product's maintenance throughout its useful life. In other words, train people to repair it, set up service outlets, produce spare parts, et cetera. Last but not least, we have to think about disposing of the product or recycling it when it ceases to be used. In other words, we must make sure the product meets environmental standards when it is put in the garbage or make provision for its recovery if it can be recycled. Engineers are not involved in the marketing stage. However, they must be aware of the processes involved and take them into account when they design, when they design an object. So as we mentioned earlier, with every product and its manufacturing, there needs to be a list of specifications. These specifications defined, def, sorry, define and specify the company's requirements. They describe the characteristics of the desired product. So you can read about the specifications in depth on pages 378 to pages to page 381. So 378 to 381 describes the specifications. We uh, mentioned before what the contents of the specifications are. All right, so um, the specifications must be produced at the very beginning of a project, okay? So in the specifications, um, the people can, uh, who are, who want to manufacture this product must express their needs as clearly as possible. So for example, they can um, talk about the weight that they want the product to be and stuff like that, okay? And in their specifications, um, there are perspectives that need to be considered, okay? So on page 379, we can read about the perspectives considered in these specifications. Every technical object has a useful life. This life begins when the object is manufactured and ends when it ceases to be used. It must then be discarded. Okay, so remember in the book, they're using a specific example. When Bike Home builds an electric bicycle, they must not only think about the requirements associated with its construction, they must also consider everything that can happen in the, bicy in the bicycle's useful life. These, the specifications must take into account every aspect of the situation. The object to be designed must be imagined from different perspectives, right? So you have to look at it from different ways. Think about the person using it, for instance. On this level, an electrical bicycle must be comfortable, easy to use, pleasant to ride, etc. Bike home might therefore require that the motor not be noisy. The object's resistance must also be considered, right? So how does it resist force? How does it resist the elements outside? So how, what's its durability? Is it gonna last? Okay, so the object's resistance must also be considered. Since a bicycle is designed for outdoor use, it must be resistant to rain. On this level, bike home must therefore require the motor, require that the motor be water, watertight. So if you look on page 379, it discusses six perspectives to consider in developing specifications. Four of them concern manufacturing, right? So the actual manufacturing of the product and two relate to its use. The elements each, the elements each perspective must take into account are described on the next page, which is page 380. You will also find an example of a set of specifications in figure five on page 381. Okay, so the perspectives. First, the physical perspective. The physical perspective concerns all the natural elements, air, water, earth, that might have an effect on an object or its use. 
The person or company designing the object must be informed of these natural elements because they must ensure that the product will stand up to these elements. Since a bicycle is used outside, for instance, it will sometimes be exposed to the rain. It must also therefore be constructed out of material that is resistant to rust. A coat of protective paint might do the trick. And also you think about something that's being exposed to outside, what about um, sun and heat, right? We need to think about the materials we use. Are they heat resistant? Is it a material that will melt in the sun? So that's something to consider as well from the physical perspective. Second perspective is the technical perspective. The technical perspective includes factors that affect the operation of the object to be designed. For instance, Bicomb must specify the maximum speed the bicycle will attain. <clears throat> the company must also indicate how long the motor can run before the batteries have, have to be recharged. Okay, so this is the technical part, it's actual functioning. Okay, third perspective is the economic perspective. The specifications must detail all costs the designer has to take into account. These include production costs, selling costs, I'm sorry, selling price, and all maintenance costs, right? So remember, you're making a product and it also, the specs spoke about how many people will be needed to make the product and manufacture it, but you can't, these people are not working for free. So you have to figure out how much is it gonna ask you, um, actually cost you in labor, right? So that's all a part of the economic perspective. The fourth perspective, the industrial perspective. The person or company designing the product must take into account the place where it is to be manufactured. They must consider the production facilities, the tools, the workforce, and the completion deadline. The manufacture of certain products, for instance, requires qualified workers. If a company does not have this workforce, they cannot meet their manufacturing objectives. Uh, right, we're on the fifth perspective, right? And that's the specifications in regards to use. So we're on this side now. The human perspective takes into account the people who will use, maintain and repair the product. The person or company should therefore design and manufacture an object that will make that, um, that people will like and that is easy to maintain. Aesthetics, safety, and comfort are also concerns. The final perspective over here, we're talking about the environmental perspective. So everything that we do, we're always trying to think about how it'll affect the environment. It's very important, right? Because as we can see, there's a lot of stuff going on in the environment and that is actually because of humans. Um, we've neglected to be environmentally aware of certain things and we've actually damaged our planet. All right, so the environmental perspective. The person or company designing the product must consider its effects on the environment. Today, for instance, manufacturers are attempting to produce automobiles that pollute less. The product's recycling potential at the end of its useful life is also a concern, right? So we've often asked the question, okay, if when this is no longer in use, is it recyclable? Is it biodegradable? If this is discarded in the environment, when it's broken down, is it dangerous for the environment? So, right, these are things we have to consider. So now we're gonna go back a little bit and look at some things in depth. We're gonna actually go back to the design phase which is the first phase of the design process. Okay, so we see here that we have to make technical diagrams, okay? You can't just make a product without having some sort of visual representation as to how this, how it's going to be put together or the, the physical specifications of this actual product. So we need technical diagrams. So we are on page 382. Technical diagrams are used in the design phase. 
These diagrams explain the functioning and essential elements of the object that, it's going to, that is going to be built. Diagrams are a quick and simple way of representing an object. This form of representation is mainly used in the stages leading up to the creation of a prototype. And remember, a prototype is one of the first copies of an object or system. It can serve as a model for testing or large scale production. All right, there are several types of technological diagrams. We will study the, di the design plan and the technical drawings here. Okay, so the design plan describes in a simplified fashion, the elements that make up an object or device and explains how they work. All right, so on page 383, they further describe the technical drawing. The design plan is the inspiration for the technical drawing. The technical drawing shows the exact configuration of the object. Following this diagram, we can manufacture the object. The technical drawing includes parts directly involved in the object's function, other parts, and links between the parts. And we use standard symbols, okay? So people, there are standard conventions and standard symbols that we use in these technical drawings. And it's just understood that these are the symbols that we use so that anybody can pick up a technical diagram or drawing and understand what's going on here and understand how to put this together and how it's gonna work. Okay, so this is a, a lot more involved. We see steam at play here, right? There is science, there's technology, there's engineering, there's art, there's math. We see dimensions here. This is math, okay? So we see how all of this stuff has come into play. So we see over here, they're actually, this is a technical diagram or technical drawing for the iPhone 5. And if you want to look at the standard symbols that we use in technical drawing, which uh, drawings which show the motion, the links, the kind of gears that the object might have, you are to go to page 384. All right, so on page 384 of your textbook, you can see the standard symbols that are used in these technical drawings. So here, this is figure nine. You can see some of the standard symbols regularly used in preparing, techni preparing technical diagrams. With these symbols, you can quickly describe motion and links, okay? So links are just what it sounds like, what keeps the separate parts in a technical object together. They also illustrate the mechanisms of motion transmission and transformation at work in an object or device. So we'll talk about the um, motion transmission and transformation um, later on. So that's the idea of um, translation, right? So movement in a line, rotation, you know, how are these parts working together? What's the motion involved? Okay, so we will cover concepts represented by these symbols in section three in the forces and motion section. Okay, so over here, you see motion, rectilinear motion, that is motion in one direction, okay? So let's say they, the part just moves to one direction, right, okay? It's not going back and forth. Alternating motion is rectilinear, uh, rectilinear in two directions, so movement in straight lines in both directions. Circular motion, right, in one direction, okay? So it's this sort of rotation or in one direction. So let's say clockwise or counterclockwise. And then you have oscillatory motion. So that's circular in two directions. So it's rotating back and forth between two directions. Then we have circular motion um, with symbols showing on part. So over here, that, did you see that little um, arrow there? That shows you that this thing is gonna be rotating, sorry, sorry, that it's going to be rotating about this axis. 
Then over here we have links, right? So links, that's how we keep the parts together. So when we look at the iPhone, you can take it apart. It's not just one part. There are multiple parts that were put together to make your phone. That's why if you drop your phone, sometimes it breaks into pieces because there's different parts. So the links are what keeps the parts together. What kind of links do we have? We have free moving parts. So this is the visual representation of that and the complete link, okay? And over here, these are the threads, okay? You know, you think about threads like the screws and stuff, nuts and bolts that you have in your technological object. So this represents a screw, okay? And this represents a nut. So you would screw this into there. And then here we have the whole system, this and this put together, it's a screw and nut system. Okay, then you have gears, okay? That's those parts that like, maybe like in a bike, you've seen a gear, right? That's involved in the motion. We have gear or sometimes called pinion. This is one way to visually represent it. This is a bevel gear. And here is a rack and pinion gear. So you're gonna look at the different types of gears that could possibly be found in a technological object. Then you have belts, pulleys, chains, and sprockets. So again, this is something that you've seen in a bike, the chain and sprocket. You've seen belt and pulleys maybe on a conveyor belt in a um, factory, okay? So these are the standard symbols that you will see on a technical drawing. You can't just make up symbols to represent things. It has to be a standard symbol system so that let's say you design a, project, a, a product and you make the technical diagram for it, but you're outsourcing somewhere else in the world to have somebody manufacture it. It has to be standard symbols that anybody in the world can understand and know how to put together your technical object, okay? And it has to be in a way that you're not writing words like this must rotate whatever over here because the words will take up too many space, too much space. So that's why we use symbols. All right, so that was our little side note on technical diagrams. All right, and we spoke about the manufacturing process sheet. All right, so the manufacturing process sheet is a document describing every stage in the manufacturing of a product. So you can read about the manufacturing process sheet in depth on page 385. All right, so on page 386 to 387, we look at the idea of raw material, material, and equipment. Before you make an object, you have to be aware of what types of materials you will be using to make this product. And that will, re that will involve making a decision about what material is best based on the use of this product. Okay, so if you need a product that if your product needs to be, let's say weather resistant, you're gonna think about, okay, well, what product is durable and can withstand the elements out, um, the elements outside? Okay, so you have to consider these things before you actually make a product because then that will also be a part of your economic perspective in terms of you will not have to know what, what kind of materials you're using because you wanna know the cost. All right. And then also you have to know what, equi what equipment is involved. What equipment do I need to extract the raw material? Okay. Or transform it. What equipment do I actually need to make or manufacture the products? Okay. So raw material. Raw material is a substance of natural origin that undergoes a transformation. Trees, for instance, are raw material. We chop them down to make planks or paper. Iron is a raw material used to produce steel. We use steel in applications such as beam and rail construction. Bauxite is, a, is the raw material that provides aluminum. 
We use raw material in virtually every sector of industry and line of business. Once transformed, raw material becomes a finished product. Okay. Material, that's on page 387. Raw material is transformed into material. The material is then used to manufacture machines, objects, or other items. In the industry, material is a basic commodity. So if you look in your textbook, figure 12, 12 shows you some of the major categories of material. Okay, and finally, we have equipment. A piece of equipment is an object, instrument, tool, or machine. It is used to extract or transform raw material or to manufacture products. See figure 13. So over here, I've just jumped to your textbook so you can see um, raw material, material, and equipment. So over here, we have um, discussion of raw material, okay? So over here, and then when we go on the next page, all right, sorry, you see over here. So raw material is transformed into material. The material is then used to manufacture machines, objects, and other items in the industry. Material is a basic commodity, figure 12, shows you some of the major categories of material. So over here, okay, and then this was equipment. A piece of equipment is an object, instrument, tool, or machine that is used to extract or transform raw material. So it's good to, come to um, do the memory checks. All right, so we are back to our PowerPoint. So raw material is a natural resource. Material is made from a raw material and equipment, for example, tools, right? The stuff that you're gonna use to actually make the material or make or manufacture the product. All right, so that is where we will stop for this lesson. We will be going on to section two, where we will talk about technological systems. Again, remember you are assigned to read, all right, textbook pages 374, okay, all the way to 387. Again, your reading pages. 374 to 387 that is the engineering the engineering section of the technological world next we will be moving on to section two which is technological systems and when we finish that we'll we will finish the technological world with section three which talks about forces and motion again have a great day and if you have any questions yes and if you have any questions please do not hesitate to email me at hinkson s at loyola.ca see you guys soon